these things. So the first thing up is the real number system. Ah, darn it. So the real numbers, what makes them up? Well, if you go back far enough, the counting numbers. If you're a caveman, you knew your counting numbers. You could count antelope, you can count sheep, you can count rocks, whatever. Um, so the counting numbers, where do they start? How oh, sad. One. Oh, one. <laughs> so the counting numbers start at one, two, three, and they go off to someplace. You guys are too quiet. They go off to that weird word infinity. What's infinity? Never ends. So does traveling around a circle, but you're really not getting anywhere. So that's generally not a good definition of infinity. What else? If I go to Cape Hatteras and I start counting the grains of sand at Cape Hatteras, is that an infinity of sand? Yes. No. Seems like it, but it's not, because eventually you're going to run out. If I take the entire planet's beaches and start counting the grains of sand on the entire planet's beaches, is that an infinity of sand? No. no, because eventually you're going to run out. So when you talk about infinity, it's not a specific number. It's the idea that once I get there, there's always one more, another one a more. There's more. So infinity is a, a weird concept. A lot of people really technically don't understand what it means because they just think of it as a large number. It's beyond a large number. Um, the technical definition is literally... Pick any number that you want, there's always one more. And when you get there, there's always one more. And when you get there, there's always one more. So uh, infinity always has that plus one idea to it. All right, so that's the counting numbers. The next numbers is not historically correct in order. The whole numbers. Historically, zero was not uh, invented. I guess you could say invented. Um, first, it came about as a placeholder. Um, second, it came out as the idea of nothingness, emptiness. But generally, it became a placeholder first for position systems like 109, 109 rather than 19. So the whole number, 0 itself, is an interesting number all by itself. Think about it. If I have a bowl of apples and I have five apples in it and I ask you how many apples are in the bowl, doesn't that sound crazy? How many apples are in the bowl? What would you answer? Five. If I show you a bowl and there's no apples in it, what would you say? None. none. No, you would not say zero. <laughs> there are zero apples in that. No, no one talks like that. You would say none. So the idea of nothingness was actually replaced with a word but not a mathematical idea. So zero by itself is kind of an interesting number historically. Um, after the whole numbers are the integers. You all should know what the integers are. You worked with them enough. Couldn't get into this class if you didn't understand how to work with them. What are they? Uh, is it all numbers plus negatives? Or? Whole numbers plus the negatives. So it's a positive and negative whole numbers. 1, 2, off to infinity. Negative 1, negative 2, off to negative infinity. Now here's an interesting theoretical idea. Out of these three sets, these are sets of numbers, um, which one's the biggest? Two. The integers, you'd think, um. right? They're all exactly the same size. They're all considered countably infinite. That's the weird thing about infinity. You're thinking, oh, this one must be bigger because it's going to infinity to the left and to the right. But you can take the whole numbers and match it up with it directly. Zero can match up with zero. One can match up with one. Two can match up with negative one. Three can match up with two. Four can match up with negative two and so forth. And I can do that for ever, for on and on and on. 
So these three sets are exactly the same size. It's really strange that way. That's why infinity boggles most people. It's just a crazy <coughs> idea. After the integers are the rational numbers. What are rational numbers? Fractions. Fractions. Um, that's one possibility, fractions. So let's talk about the fraction definition of a rational number. A rational number fraction form is P over Q, where P, A, and Q are integers. That is the fractional definition of what it means to be rational. There's one little small problem with that definition. What is it? Yes, I ask silly questions and I expect you to answer. Get used to it. I don't sit up here and just lecture. I ask. Oh, and by the way, I make mistakes purposely, and you have to correct me. I say it purposely. That just makes me seem smarter than if I just make a mistake. But I do make mistakes, especially calculation-wise. There's a reason. I didn't learn my multiplication tables until sixth grade. Think about that for a second. Sixth grade. When do most people learn their multiplication tables? Third grade. Third and fourth. Yeah, somewhere down there. Sixth grade. I was in remedial reading. That means when I was in seventh grade, I was reading at a fourth grade level. I have a master's in math now. What do you think I thought of education when I was in grade school? Useless. Boring. <laughs> but after I learned my multiplication tables, I just took off. It, it was so easy after that. I just didn't have any interest. I needed an interest in something for me to want to do it. So here's a little clue if you want to succeed in college. Be interested in everything. Whether you are or not, fool yourself into being interested in everything. That makes it interesting. That makes you want to do it. That makes you succeed in the end. It's kind of an interesting philosophy. What's wrong with that definition? I gave you enough time to think about it. Uh, what can't you do? Look at the integers. The integers are negative numbers, positive numbers, and zero. Oh, you can't divide zero. Can't divide by zero. Q definitely cannot equal zero. <laughs> then my next question is this: Why? Why? <clears throat> what? Nope. If you could always get it equal to zero, you'd be multiplying by zero. That's the zero property of multiplication. Mm -hmm. You cannot physically divide by zero. What that means is, if you have a number, 5, and you divide it by zero, if you could divide by zero, it would equal some number. Let's call it A. But there is no such number A that 5 divided by zero is equal to. Want me to prove it? I bet you've never seen a proof. I bet most teachers say you can't do it. And you went, okay. Right? So let's prove it. Um, to prove that this number A does not exist, let's do this. What's 10 divided by 5? 2. 2, right? So I can set up this equation. 10 divided by 2, uh, <laughs> can't even talk to them. 10 divided by 5 is 2. Can I multiply both sides of this equation by 5? Is that legal? Yes. yes. Do you know what it's called? That not. Most people just do it and don't think about why they do it. It's called the multiplication property of equality. Whatever you multiply on the left, you just have to multiply the same thing on the right. What's 5? Literally, what happens here is 5 divided by 5. Well, what's 5 divided by 5? One. 1. What's 1 times 10? Ten? 10. All right. And that equals, what's 2 times 5? 2. And this equation balances. Both sides keep the equality going. So that side checks off. Well, what if I do the same thing to my 5 divided by 0 is equal to some number a? Now, this is making an assumption. This is making the assumption I can divide by 0. Everybody understand what I'm just doing? I'm saying something that is totally opposite of what I've said. This is called a proof by contradiction. So, if I say I can divide by 0, it must equal some kind of answer, some number on the other side. I'm going to do the same process as I did above. If I can divide by 0, and I multiply both sides by 0, up here I said 5 divided by 5, because one was in the top and the other one is in the bottom. Same thing here. 0 divided by 0 must equal 1, because 5 divided by 5, any number divided by itself is 1. So this is 1 times 5, which is 
5. What's a times 0? Zero? 0. 0. The multiplication property of 0. Does this equation balance? No. no. So my assumption must have been wrong. I assumed I could divide by 0, but this proves I can't. There's another proof that's numeric. We'll get to that uh, chapter 3, I think it is. And I'll show you that numeric uh, definition. So, it's P over Q where Q definitely cannot equal zero. They could be positive, they could be negative. Um, leave things like eight-thirds on a test. Do not change it into a mixed number two and two-thirds. Two and two-thirds? Yeah, two and two-thirds. I hate mixed numbers. Mixed numbers are good for one thing. What is it? Well, two things. What are they? Two and two-thirds? Cups? Which would be what? <laughs> Cooking. And one and one eighth inch, which would be using a ruler. Those are the only two places you use mixed numbers. Everywhere else in the world, uh, actually the rest of the world doesn't even use fractions. They change everything into decimals. If you grew up in Europe, you would never even learn fractions. You would just go with decimals the entire way. Okay, so the other definition of rationals is the decimal one. Decimal. The decimal definition, uh, let's look at three-fourths. What's the decimal representation of three-fourths? 0.75. right? 0 0.75. You don't have to put the zero, but most people do. And what about um, two-thirds? Six, six, six. You get that great number. Six, six, six. How many? How many? Keep on going? How far? Forever. <laughs> Put a little bar on top of it. It's a repeater. So if you're going to go for fractions as your definition of rational numbers, you call them you know, P over Q. If you're going to talk about decimals, though, we have to give a name to these. This one is called terminating. It's not rounded, it is terminal. That means it's exactly equal to 3 fourths, 0.75. There's no decimals after it, it's just 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, forever. Um, this one here, since it goes on forever with the same digit over and over again, you could also have like 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. That would be a repeating decimal. These are, of course, called repeating. So if you have a terminating and or repeating decimal, it is also known as a rational number because they come from fractions. What little hole did I just introduce into my real numbers? I said that rational numbers, oh, by the way, a counting number is a whole number, is an integer, is a rational number. So if you come down this way, if you pick a number from up here, it goes through the whole thing. So if I pick an integer, negative 1, it is also a rational number, because it write it as negative 1 over 1. That's pretty simple. So when I get down to this definition of terminating or repeating decimals, there's a gap in there. I'm missing something. What am I missing? Well, what if a decimal is not terminating and it doesn't repeat? What do I get then? What's the only other numbers left? Uh -huh. No, whole numbers are up here. If you have a decimal that is non-terminating, that means it keeps on trucking off to infinity, but it doesn't do this repeating idea, what kind of decimal does that become? Well, let's put it this way. The Greeks thought this was the real numbers way back when, you know, Pythagoras and all that other fun stuff, Euclid. Um, they thought the rational numbers measured any length. That's how they dealt with math. They were measurements. They were lengths. And then they came up with this nice little idea. We have a right triangle. Anybody know Pythagorean's theorem? Yep. C squared equals A squared plus B squared. You know, the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square of the legs. And they put this and this there, one and one. If you do Pythagorean's theorem on this, what's this side become? One squared plus one squared is? One, two. two. C squared equals two. How do I get C by itself? How do you get rid of a square? Divide. Square root, square root. Mm -hmm. This side becomes the square root of 2. What kind of number is the square root of 2? Rational. It's definitely not rational. It's irrational. Irrational. it's irrational. So if you are not either of those, you are irrational. What's another good def uh, example of an irrational number? Famous one. 
deals with circles, or pi. Um, there's another one we're going to be learning um, in this class. It's E. That's later on. There are computers that are still generating decimal places of pi. There are people that can tell you the first 250 digits of pi. They are called nerds. I am not one of them. No, I am a nerd, but not that type. So irrational numbers are really interesting in a lot of respects. Everything in green up here, the counting, the whole, the integers, and the rational numbers, they are all the exact same size. Countably infinite. When you get to irrational numbers, all bets are off. That's called a dense system. That means you cannot even attach it to one of these values up here because those decimals go off for ever. And all you have to do is change one decimal place out of an infinite of them, and you have a new number. So that, that means that the irrational numbers are crazy. So let me play a game. Ready? Game time. Give me a number. Mm -hmm. Give me a number. Three. Give me a number. Seven. Give me a number. Six. You're awake now, all right? <laughs> Give me a number. Easy. Number. This is awesome. You guys are all in kindergarten. Count Dracula taught you those numbers on Sesame Street. I have just taught you the entire real numbers. And no one even said square root of 2, which is right here. Negative numbers? Fractions? Decimals? Not one of you. 5, 8, 13. Why? Because what you first learned in your life, you're most comfortable with. And when you are put on the spot, your brain goes back to kindergarten. In everything, by the way. Everything you learned in kindergarten is the first thing that comes to your brain. And then you have to kind of filter through it. I need you down here. The world works down here in irrational and rational land. I mean, even money. $5.99. Right? No one said five ninety nine. $5.99. Um... The real world really works on the irrational system because most things are based on pi and e, which is really weird, but that's later on. But it is mostly based on uh, irrational numbers. So my idea is to get you away from kindergarten and bring you up to college, which is over here in the irrationals. Okay, second thing I need to run through, which is not in the book, besides all that, What's funny is I find that a lot of teachers of math don't teach this anymore, and I don't know why. When I was learning math, every math teacher I got, it didn't matter what level of math it was, this is what they started with, the properties of real numbers. Because if you ever get stuck in algebra, you always come back to these, and these will unstick you. These are how everything works in the real number system, and all we really deal with is for the most part, real numbers. We'll eventually do a little bit of imaginary, but not a ton of it. Um, so the properties of real numbers start off with, oh, which one should I start with? Oh, let's do with music. You've heard of these before, right? I teach with these. This is the basis of how algebra works. When algebra first was invented, created, a lot of people tried to prove that it didn't work because they thought that replacing numbers with letters was just wrong, kind of like you all do. They think it's all just wrong. But they found out that working with letters is the same thing as working with numbers because it followed the properties of real numbers. What's commutative property? Anybody remember? Really sad, isn't it? <laughs> How many years have you taken math? You know, all through grade, you should have learned these in grade school. Um, a plus B is equal to B plus A. It means that if you have addition, it doesn't matter what order you do it in, as long as you do it. Is subtraction commutative? No. No, but there is a property of subtraction I need you to know. So if you want to think of it, the commutative property of subtraction is this. If you have A minus B, it is equal to the opposite of B minus A. It's the opposite. So if you flip over subtraction, what you're doing is changing a sign. I'll give you an example. 5 minus 3 is equal to what? 
2, right? So if I do 3 minus 5, that's equal to negative 2. So to change its sign back to 2, I just put a minus up front. So in algebra, if you ever take two things over subtraction and flip them, all you have to do is put a minus out front, in a front of parentheses, not up to front of the three. All right, so that's the commutative property of addition, and if you want to think of it, the commutative property of subtraction. It does have it, but you have to do it in adjustment. All right, multiplication has one. A times B is equal to B times A. 2 times 3 is the same thing as 3 times 2. Kids learn this real early on. I remember seeing worksheets for second, first graders, and they would have 5 plus 0, 0 plus 5, 2 plus 3, 3 plus 2, and they'd try to get the idea across that those things are not changing. So that's the commutative property. Order for addition and multiplication do not matter. Um, associative. This is the one that people think they know, and then they screw up later, which is amazing for me. I'll show you the screw up in a second. The associative property deals with three things. Um, let me write one down. If you have 2 times 3 times 4, all operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, they're all called binomial operators. What's bi mean? Two. two. You can only do two at a time. There is nobody in the world that can go 2 times 3 times 4 in one step. They have to do it in two steps. Now, the two steps they choose are either multiply the first two together. Two times three is six. Take that answer and multiply it by four. That would give you up to, what, 24? Or you could take your two times three times four, multiply the last two together, 12, and then turn around and multiply by the first number, which is 24 again. So this is called the associative property. Now, the one thing to notice is the order of the numbers is not changing. They're staying exactly the same, 2, 3, 4, 2, 3, 4. The only thing changing is the parentheses, instead of being on the first two, is now on the second two. So commutative changes order. Associative moves parentheses. That's all it does. It moves parentheses over different stuff. Um, addition is the same way. It is another binomial operator, so you can only do two together at the same time. So you either do 2 plus 3, which is 5, add it to 4 and get you 9, or you add the last two together, 7, 3 plus 4, and add the 2 back, and that gives you 9. Again, the order of the numbers is not changing. The parentheses are just shifting. They're just shifting. That's the associated property. These two, most people just do up in their noggin, and they understand it perfectly fine. But I need you to be able to analyze what's going on in algebra because that's where most people get confused when letters start getting introduced. The one that really throws people is this one. Most people understand how to do it. Distributive property. But because they do it so quickly, they screw it up. Um, especially when negatives are involved. When you get into those integers and the distributive property, all things do not work out well. Um, A times B plus C. The distributed property says if you have a product, a uh, number times a sum, then you can multiply the first one, multiply the second one, and take the two answers and add them together. So this becomes A times B plus A times C. What people forget about the distributed property is it doesn't necessarily have to go left to right. It also can go right to left. Most people call that factoring. So if you start off with m times n plus m times p, how do I distribute that, or anti-distribute it? m times the quantity n plus p. Most people call that the distributive property. Uh, I'm sorry, factoring for the second one, distribution for the first one. But it's technically all the distributive property. So where do people make mistakes? I have seen, ready for this one? Ah, stretch my arms, crack my neck. I'm going to write it out simplistically, but they still do this later technically. I have seen somebody do this. You see 2 times 3 times 4, right? The answer is supposed to be 24. 24. I have seen them come up with 6 times 8, 
which is 48. How did they do it? I'm not saying that it was a literal problem 2 times 3 times 4. I'm saying it was three things multiplied together. And what they did was they distributed the 2 to the other two numbers. In other words, they took this property and this property and jammed it all together. And they ended up with an answer that makes absolutely no sense. So be careful. That's why these properties are here, to back up where you're... Th you might be thinking of trying something. These properties will prevent you from trying something silly. They've prevented me from trying things that are really silly. So obviously that makes absolutely no sense. No sense whatsoever. All right, there's two more properties. Kind of important, and then I'll show you how we're going to be using them. So, identity. There's this field in math called abstract algebra, which is outrageously crazy stuff, and I hated it. I only got a C in that class, and that's sad. I got an A in every other math class except that one. Um, and it dealt with a lot of identities and inverses and a few of these properties, and each one of them defines a certain thing. And you can get really, well, the title is abstract algebra, so guess what? You can get really abstract about it. Um, so these are really important. Identity. Uh, one identity, um, a plus zero equals, I love when people say zero, I really do, because then I get to pick on you, a is equal to a, a, oh, I'm sorry, one times a, a, one times anything is itself, doesn't change anything, that's why they're called the identity, or keeps their identity. So a plus nothingness is a, and 1 times a is a. By the commutative property, a times 1 is also a, and 0 plus a is a. Those are just the identity properties. You use those all the time when you're solving an equation. When I solve an equation for you, we're going to go through step by step and talk about what property did we use to do this. Um, inverses. You can only have inverses if you have an identity. Otherwise, you can't even define what an inverse is. And an inverse works this way. You start off with A. You want to add something to it so that it'll come out to the additive identity, 0. So what do I have to add to A to get it back to the identity, which is 0? Negative A. It's opposite. So A plus negative A is equal to 0. So negative A is considered the inverse of positive A. All right, what about a times some number is going to be the multiplicative identity, which is 1. 1 over a. 1 over a, also known as its inverse. Well, it's a multiplicative inverse, but it's also called its reciprocal. Reciprocal. So anytime you want to get rid of an a, you multiply it by 1 over a, if you want to get rid of it with multiplication. It turns it into an identity. Additively, you want to take a and just subtract a, technically and get it down to zero. So, commutative, change the order of operations. Associative, leave the numbers alone, move parentheses. Distributive, either bring something in with multiplication or take something out. Oh, by the way, if I bring the A in with multiplication, how did I take the M out? Division. Division. So when we do factoring, it's technically dividing out things. Okay, so where do we use these? Well, let me ask you this. For example, 5x plus 3x equals. I know. Aren't I silly? Would you ever see this on one of my tests? No. no. So what's it equal to? 8x. What well, property? Commutative? Nope. Stop guessing. Think. Social. Now, oh, there, are there parentheses there? Distributive property. But technically, the bottom one here. Like here, I have mn plus mp. What did I kick out? 
M, because it was common. Well, what's common? X. X. If I kick out the X, what's left behind? 5 plus 3. So this becomes 8X. That's why it's 8X. It's not because you kind of ignore the X's, you add the 3 and the 5 and you get 8X out. Uh, the reason I like showing this is I've had people, <laughs> I love this one, I've had people say, oh, that's equal to X squared. Or 2X squared. I've even had 2X squared before. And the problem with that is, the only way you can get X squared is if you have X times X, not X plus X. But their brain wasn't thinking about it right. So the way I like people thinking about it is, well, there's a 1 here, there's a 1 here. Why can I put 1s in front of those Xs? Because there's an X there. The identity property. Remember, equations you can read backwards. If I have A by itself, I can always write it as 1 times A. If I have A by itself, I can also write it as A over 1. That's also the identity property. So these properties, there, there's reasons why I show them to you because it allows you to put things back which were hidden, which are not seen. Now, once I have 1x plus 1x, this becomes, kick out the x, 1 plus 1, better known as 2x. The properties allow you to do things so you do not make silly mistakes. You get your brain going in the right direction. I don't want you thinking of math as just shortcuts, because math is definitely not a bunch of shortcuts. Shortcuts come after you understand what the heck is going on. Before you understand what's going on, you really should do it the long way. Why? Because eventually I'm going to ask you to do this. Combine the like terms. What's it equal to? To combine like terms, you want one instance of x. Right now I have two. So how do I create just one? Why would I do it any different? Kick out the x. Once you kick out the x, what's left behind? Five plus the square root of three. Pi plus the square root of three. How many terms on the left side? Two. How many terms on the right side? One. Terms are defined by multiplication, and this is this times x, so that's one term. So that is combining the like terms. Now, is it a nice answer? Heck no. Um, later, we're going to be doing things like this. Ax plus bx equals a plus b quantity times x. We're going to be doing a ton of this weird stuff, and you have to understand it. Understanding that 5x plus 3x is equal to 8x is trivial. Understanding that ax plus bx is equal to the sum of a and b times x is really important. Uh, because we're going to use this fact uh, every once in a while. We don't do too much pi and square root of 3. And, well, I'll probably throw them at you, but the book won't. <sighs> Um, I might want to skip that for now. I want to do this one first, but what time is it? Let's take a break. Yes.